Hello, my name is Andy Wardley, um, and I'm here to talk about the Template Toolkit. <coughs> uh, TT is now, uh, it was officially born in 1999, which means it's 10 years old. Um, now, I'm not sure what the conversion rate is, I know dogs, it's about 7 years to 1, so I think in internet years, that means she's over 100. And quite frankly, she smells of a piss. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's time for her to die. So I'm pleased to say that there is actually now a, a working version of TT3 that you can download and use. Uh, you can get it from GitHub, and you'll also need Badger, which is kind of like all the um, base layer system and modules that make it nice. Uh, there's a website which hasn't got much at the moment, but the slides from this will be up there soon, and instructions on how to build it and stuff. Uh, but for now, just clone the Git repository and do the usual Perl make files, make, make tests, and so on. And we'll be able to run some of these examples. So um, here's an example of a new Perl script using the new template 3 module. Um, this is a, a bit of a temporary measure because I obviously don't want to change the template module that you're relying on to work using TT2. So um, for the short term at least, you need to use the template 3 module and all of the modules behind it live in the template TT3 namespace rather than the template namespace. And eventually they get moved up and it'll become a new, a new version. Um, so we use a, template t use a template 3 module, create an object and call the process method just like you would in TT2. Um, say the input template you want to process, the data you want to fill in, and optionally the output file name, and it will go and do that for you. Uh, one difference between TT3 and TT2 is that TT3 throws all errors as, as exceptions. So you can't accidentally miss an exception. Um, that was a very bad design decision. Um, if you don't want to throw an exception, you can use the try method. This is something that's provided by the uh, Badger base class. The try just puts a wrapper around the next method. You put an eval wrapper around the next method. So um, you could just write eval yourself and use try timing, but that's just a little shortcut. So if you call it with a try, it will downgrade an exception to just return it undef, and then you can use TT3 error to fetch the error back out. Uh, and that applies to all objects and all methods you can just try them if you like. Um, this is what options look like. There's no more shouting! <laughs> so all the options are in lowercase. And that actually goes back to the fact that it's so old. It comes, it, um, TT1 was written in a version of Perl where you couldn't put lowercase words on the left hand side of an arrow. So it had to be an uppercase, that's how old it is. Uh, but now we're back into lowercase and um, template path is the new name for include path. Um, because we don't just do including anymore, and it makes more sense. There's no more absolute or relative options. These were bad, ignore them. Um, if you don't specify a template path, TT will just give you access to the whole of your file system. It assumes you're a programmer and you know what you're doing. If you do specify a template path, then you can only fetch templates from that one directory. You can't go out of it in any way. And if you want to be able to access it from these templates, and anywhere on your file system, just create a template path that says here and my root, and then you can find that root. Uh, TT3 also allows you to call class methods. So if you just want to process a template, instead of creating a template object, calling process, and then throwing it away, you can have TT3 do it for you. Um, except that it doesn't actually throw the object away. So if you call a class method, it will silently create a little object in the background and then cache it as a singleton so that all class methods get called on the same object. So your caching continues to work and everything just carries on nicely. Uh, the process method is like TT2's process where you can put on headers and footers and wrappers and all sorts of niceties. But if you just want to process a template at a slightly lower level, you can use the fill method. And here it's got slightly different parameters. You specify the template type, which tells you where to get it from, either file or text or Something else you want to add on database, HTTP, whatever. Um, give it a template name or template URI. Uh, and then you select what data you want to fill in. And then the fill method will go up and find that template, fill it in, and return the text. So here we're just doing print to get it back. But again, if it's an error, exception thrown. So you don't need to do any error checking. There's also the template, template method, which will go off and fetch a template and return a template object. So you can then just pass that around, and when you want to fill it in, you can call its own fill method on the template object, and pass in your variables as it will run the template and generate the output. 
So that's how you use it. Let's have a look at the template language. This is um, a very simple template and it's exactly the same as it would be in TG2. Uh, a bit of text. Um, can't, why is it not pointing on the pin there? A bit of text, um, simple tag, and we've got a little expression here. Uh, TT3 has got a brand new parsing system. It's got a non-destructive tokenizer, which means it goes through all the bits and it finds out what you've got, a bit of text, start tag, a word, and it saves all of them so that you can regenerate the template later if you need to. Uh, it's got a brand new operator precedence parser, which means a lot of the bugs in TT2 that came from you know, A equals B if C would get parsed wrong, you end up with something weird, all that's fixed, gone away. Um, the parser generates a complete parser tree. It turns the template into something like a document object model, which you can then walk and look around at and stuff. And you can also easily transform it to other things, so transform the template to Perl for a faster runtime, or to HTML for debugging, or to JavaScript if you want to deploy it on the browser, and so on. So this example, in fact, all the examples you see here have been rendered by TT3. So my slides are created using one of Inge's tools, Spork, and that uses TT2 to render the templates. So I've got a TT2 plugin which takes my little examples, loads TT3, it parses it in TT3, and then has it generate the HTML nicely sit marked up so I can do the syntax highlighting on these examples. Uh, and this, if we look inside, this is a the debug output that you get from TT3. So it shows you your source tokens here with syntax highlighting. You can see a complete list of everything it found in the template. It will show you a parse tree. So it goes through the tokens and turns them into expressions. A bit of text or a Boolean expression here. You can also see what variables are used in the template. And it will show you an abstract of where they're used. And we can also see the output of the template. <laughs> Thank you. So, I gathered from that that, like me, you spent a lot of time debugging templates and swearing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah, it's a lot better now. <coughs> so that's a simple template. Here's a slightly more complicated example. Again, things to notice, there's no more shouting! <laughs> All the keywords are in lowercase. Um, Can the old shouty version still work? Yes, I'll come to that. Well, they don't work by default, but you can turn them on. Um, there's no more shouting. Uh, we've got the same old chompy operators here. This little minus says remove this white space afterwards, so it helps to compress your output. Um, and the one thing that's different is uh, within a for loop, um, item is the new name for the item that it iterates over one before. So that's the equivalent of dollar underscore and above. And let's have a little look inside this template. You can see the template tree there. It's an if block. It's testing this. Uh, it does a four, we can click down here and see what it would be. Um, so there's a nested variable it's using, so we get all the way down to order the items, dot size, and so on. Pattern line one, and line three. And then, oh no, we've had an error. Oh dear. Um, this is another thing where TT3 is actually a lot better in the error reporting. So when you do get an error, it tells you the exact line that it happened on, not the line, you know, half an hour ago where I happened to do a little check. It tells you the exact line, the name of the template, tells you what the error is. In this case here, we were trying to, we, TC, were trying to evaluate order of items, and it turns out the order was undefined, and it shows you the source code with a little here. It doesn't bounce yet, but I'm sure I can take that out. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I have to stand there, you know, ring me up and say, I need you to bounce, and I probably need to curse up. Um, so that's, uh, again, other than the few minor syntax changes, it's the same. Um, now, in TT2, there's just one tag star. In TT3, we've actually got four. Um, these are your basic inline tags, square brackets with the sense, and they work exactly the same as in TT2. We've also got outline tags. So if you have a single line that starts with percent percent, then it's a one-line tag, and it automatically chomps the new line off the end of the line. So for things like this, where you've just got a single if or a single for, it makes it a lot easier and makes the templates easy to read and so on. So outline tags, single line tags, automatically chop the new line that I said all up. Um, here's the third kind of tag, comment tags. So if you want to write some comments, you can of course put comments in your tags, just using the hash character, but you can also create comment blocks 
Um, and inside those comment blocks, you can have other tags and other stuff, and TT will just ignore it. So if you've got a bit of sit, sorry? There's comments in there as well. Um, not these kind of comments, but you can put other comments with just hashes in. Um, so a comment block will just start at the start tag and then find the next end of comment tag. So if you try and mess them, you will get problems. But you can put all the other tags in there. So if you just want to disable a bit of code while you're testing something, or if you want to put in some documentation, say, this is how you use this template, include blah, blah, blah. Um, so that's good for that. Oh, and then the fourth kind of tag are control tags. So these are like XML processing instructions. They're actually the tags that happen really early on when the template's being parsed. Um, and these are the, the tags that affect how you actually parse the template language. So if you want to, for example, change the tags that you're using, instead of square bracket percent, you can use the tags directive inside these special control tags. And then that will change the tags as they happen go through the template. Um, because we've now got four different tags, the default ones are the inline ones. Just saying tags like this would change the tags file. You could also say I want the inline tags to change, or you can specify Asherah and say I want to change a whole bunch of different tags on that. And you can say off to turn the tag off and on to turn it back on again. Obviously if you turn off the control tags, you've got no way of turning them back on again because you can't embed a control tag to turn them on. Um, and you can also disable or enable these from the as well. So you can say, just do this, but ignore control tags, ignore comment tags, whatever. How are they scoped? Are they file scoped? So file scoped. Something yes. You, yeah. Yeah, file scoped. Can you do outline tags? Can you do all to the outline tag? Yes, you can. Um, I haven't included that because it's slightly broken. Um, <laughs> at the moment, the outline tag is actually an inline tag that knows that its end tag is a new line. Yeah, okay. And it screws up some of the comments and things. Because, so yeah, it, you can, but not, not quite yet. Got some more points down there, which probably not that interesting. Then these features. So there's four different um, tags: the inline, outline, common control. But you can also create your own tags. If you've got template processing things you want to do, where you don't necessarily need a whole template language, but you just want to find some stuff and shuffle it around, then you can use some of the lower-level components of TT to help do that. So here's a, a classic example of um, kind of BB code like markup. Um, now I should say there are plenty of fine modules on C-Shack that do BB code and you shouldn't be using those. This is just an example. Um, but to pass something like this, we can create our own scanner object. And we tell it that instead of using the standard TT3 tag set, we want to create our own tag set. And the first tag we want to look for, we'll call bold. This is just the names that you can identify. We say it's a simple replacement tag. It starts with a B in square brackets. It ends in a slash B in square brackets, and I want to replace whatever you find with the output of the subroutine. So it just calls that subroutine, and here we can switch it to HTML version. So that's a tag that finds those little bold tags and replaces them. And we can also do the same for italic and any other tags we want to find. So then we can take our scanner and say, here's our text, scan the text, and it returns a list of tokens that it finds in the document. This is a template tokens object, which is just a very lightweight object, less in a list. Um, and you can call the tree method on that, which then compiles it and turns it into a full-blown template. And then you can call the text method on that to effectively run the template <coughs> and spit your text back out. Um, that's, that's at least 20 characters there, so we can shorten that to just <laughs> scan and transform. And then we run that and it'll actually run the template and spit out our generated text. Of course, you can do that using regexes or something else much quicker. But it illustrates how easy it is to change the template language, either to add your own tags or change the whole language altogether. If we want to reuse that, we can create a template dialect. So here we've got a package, template x, which is the new namespace for extension modules, template x dialect, and we'll call it BB code. It's a subclass of template TT3 dialect. And then here we just define our tag sets as before. As a package variable, out of our tag set, and then the base class will automatically define that, um, merge it in any tag set it's defined, which is done, and do a dialect. So now we can plug that into TT3, saying use template 3, and the dialect we want, instead of TT3, we actually want to use our new BB code template dialect. And then we can just call fill, pass it some text, in a different template language, and it will run it and process it for us. 
And you get all the debugging tools and the debugging tools and stuff. Um, now what we can do is we can take our template path and say we've actually got three different directories here. We've got path to templates TT3, which contains our brand spanking new TT3 template. And we've also got path to templates TT2, which contains some slightly stale old TT2 template. And we've also got our new code, our BB code, dialect in different directory. So with these three template paths defined, you can now say, give me a template, and it will first of all look for it in the TT3 directory, and if it finds it, it will give you back a TT3 compiled template. If it doesn't find that, it will go and look in the TT2 directory and give you back a TT2 template. And if it doesn't find it there, it will go and look in the BB code directory and give you back a BB code template. So you can actually mix and match any number of different template languages all under the same basic template processing framework. And the nice thing is that because they're all just templates, your TT2 templates can include TT3 templates, and your TT3 templates can include TT2 templates, or HTML template templates, or whatever other dialect you care to plug in. And they can both call on new DB code templates if they want to. So there's a lot more flexibility there in, um, in the fact that TT3 has been separated from TT3 the language, and TT3 the modules are actually run it. So you can use TT3 the modules with a different template language, like either the TT2 template language, or the template dialect, I should say, or the TT3 one. Uh, so TT3's got real expressions. Um, I mentioned that you've got this new parser, and everything just works. Uh, let's have a little look inside that just to show you. There's the variables we use. We can actually go and look at something like this and check that all the Parsed it properly and all the operating precedents work in the right order. <coughs> so that's very useful, not just for day to day use, but also for me writing the parser and check that it's doing the right kind of stuff. Um, in TT3, everything's an expression. Um, wherever you can use a variable, you can put in a full expression. Uh, with TT2, the parser was very bit hit and miss. Um, but all expressions are interchangeable. And it all just works because of the operating precedents. Everything gets grouped correctly. Um, as they should do. Um, so we've got all the um, usual mathematical operators. In fact, with TT3, I've put in pretty much every operator that you can use in Perl. Um, TT2 had a, a number of violations of the principle of least surprise, where you'd expect something to look like Perl, and you'd do it like Perl, and you'd find out that I thought the different way was slightly better, or well, I was wrong. So now um, everything looks like Perl if you want to look like Perl. Sorry? Even if you were right, you were wrong. Because <laughs> <laughs> Larry was right. So we've got the uh, numerical comparison operators, all the text comparison operators. Um, text concatenation is the squiggly line, um, because obviously dot is very special in TT3. I'm not sure what Perl 6 have decided they need now. It changes every six months or so. Um, but in TT3, it's the squiggly line. Uh, and you can use either infix to join two bits of text together, or you can use it as a prefixed operator, say, Please convert the next thing to text if you possibly can. Smart contract? No. Not yet. But it's easy to add. I'll, I'll come to that. Um, we've also got all the Boolean operators. Um, TT3's got the, the equivalent of Perl's slashy slash ones. Um, and as far as I recall, I actually built this bit of the parser before Perl 510 decided to use slashy slashes. Um, and I can't get on with slashy slashes because to me they're JavaScript comments or C comments. So at the moment we're stuck with bang bangs or exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Sorry? Is this case wrong? Am I wrong? Yeah. Yeah. I'm wrong. <laughs> but don't worry, I'm coming to that. Um, we've also got the regular assignment operator, and we've also got the proper fat comma borrowed from Perl, the arrow operator. Um, this is particularly important when if you call a function like this, TT3 assumes you're just using name parameters and it will merge them all up into a single hash pass into your function like that. So it's quite convenient, but sometimes your functions aren't written expecting that. So in TT3, if you use the arrow operator, you get exactly as you would in Perl. It just literally quotes the item on the left, and you get a better list. And if you want to pass a hash ref, and you want to be explicit, again, just write it just like you would in Perl, and you get just what you would get in Perl. So there's fewer surprises there. Uh, there's also a, a single arrow operator, but I broke this last week. Um, and this is one of the things, because these uh, slides are being rendered by TT3, it won't actually compile this code because it's broken, so I have to comment it out. 
Um, <laughs> but it's good, you know, it's good, it reminds me, I've written some of um, The arrow can be used to create very lightweight functions. So this here is a function that takes A and it returns A plus 1. And this is a function that takes A and B and returns A plus B. Um, so this is particularly useful if you've got a bunch of users, say, a list of users, and you want to go through each one, and you could write for each user in blah, blah, blah. Yes, Peter. No, 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 I was just thinking, might you make your writing a parser easier to pinch the Haskell backslash to introduce the one? You don't need to, because the, the parser actually smart enough not to need that. Um, but yeah, I did consider that, but I might still do that. But it's quite nice, or, or just use a proper Android operator, because yeah. we support UTF-8, so you can have UTF-8 template and so on. Anyway, um, back, to, back to the point. Um, so, for example, if you've got a list of users, you can, part, you can call users.each and pass a function. And in this case, it's a function that takes a user and it returns where their user surname involved followed by their forename. So, you call users.each and you're passing a function, and then users.each will call your function once for each user in the list. Uh, and similarly, if you want to sort two users, you can just say, well, give me two users A and B, and I'll run this with your code to um, so whereas TT2, we tried to provide lots of virtual methods that just did all sorts of different sorting things, now the approach is, like Perl, provide one sort and give you the mechanism to write your own lightweight functions to extend that if you need to. Um, we've also got all the self-modifying operators, so you can increment numbers, decrement them, and so on and so on. Um, this is how the... Um, the parser combines all those symbols together. So there's just one big symbol table where we say, look out for this token here. This gives a, a short internal ID. So sig item, for example, gets mapped to template tt3 element sig ill item. But that gets done somewhere else. And these are the precedence levels. Um, one for infix operators, which is the leftward precedence, how tight I bind to my thing over here. And I'm on my left. Yeah. And the right with precedence is for prefix operators like dollar. So dollar binds very tightly to a word after it. Um, but if you want to change the grammar and you don't like these operators or you think it should be slashy slashy instead of bangy bangy, then you can just go and create your own symbol table like this. And again, you just stuff this definition into a dialect file and it will apply those changes. So again, with TT3, it was kind of let's write a template language that keeps everyone happy. TT3, TT2. TT3 is more accepting the fact that you're never going to be happy, so it's more about giving you the capability to define your own template language, or take an existing template language and turn off a bunch of operators, or turn off some keywords or add some extra things in. Um, so if you don't like the idea of people being able to set variables in a template, you can just disable the equals operator and all the other operators that do that kind of stuff. Um, functions. There's a slight change to the way functions work. Um, they're more like JavaScript now. So you put a foo, which is a function that you've passed to it as a function reference. Um, you can just put your brackets on as normal and it'll call the function. Also, if you just print a function, if this is a reference to a bit of code and you just kind of print it, there's no print in TT, but if you just you know, put it in the input stream, then TT will effectively auto stringify it. It'll say, that, that's a function, I can't print that, okay, I'll call it. But if you have a function reference and you're like foo here and you assign it to something else, or if you pass it to another function, it will remain a function reference. So you can actually pass functions around a lot easier without resorting to undocumented hacks. Um, but if you do actually want to call it, then just put the brackets afterwards and that will automatically apply the function. Um, so this is exactly the same as JavaScript and those kind of functional languages where curly brackets means, you know, it's, it's the function application operator. Uh, you can also create your own subroutines in TT. Again, this is um, the principle of least surprise for Perl programmers. So there is a sub keyword now. Again, you can be saying it if you don't like it. Uh, but sub will just create a lightweight sub or create a subroutine for you. So that's it in, in traditional TT2 style, where we've got the semicolons here acting as delimiters. The final of the bold thing, it takes some text and it just spits back out a bit of HTML. And that's us calling it called the hello stream, hello world stream. CT3, sorry, there's a question, no? Uh, how is that script? Uh, lexically. Uh, no, um, that is effectively global. Well, global is dynamic. 
<laughs> Should I have? <laughs> Um, so if you're stuck in the header, you have access to it. <coughs> yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, if you've done it inside the equivalent of the include, yeah. then it would be local. Uh, so if, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Um, I have got lexical variables spaced on there, but I haven't included them yet. And yet, I don't know how to use them. Um, so we also support curly braces for creating blocks, just like well. Um, yeah. <laughs> Took long enough. Um, and TC3 will also allow you to omit the braces if you've just got a single expression. So this is like, like JavaScript, C, and C++, and so on. A lot of people think it's dangerous, and it can be dangerous, but it can also be very powerful, and I'll show you some of those later. So that creates a nice, uh, simple, bold subroutine. Uh, and we can also create it, as in Perl, sub can be used as an, anon <laughs> an, 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 an anonymous subroutine creator. So this subtext here is creating a subroutine, and then we just assign it to the bold variable. Um, again, we can omit the braces because it's a single expression, and do it like that. Or there's another shortcut where you can just specify a subroutine like this. So you put the parentheses on the left-hand side of the equal sign, and TT3 will automatically say, well, you know, you put parentheses on there, so therefore I'm going to assume you're creating a function. Just if you assign to bold with an arrow expression, is that all treated as a subroutine in the same way as that? Um, no. Um, so if bold equals text, arrow, blah, blah, blah? Yes, 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 yeah. single arrow. Yes, yes, so you can, that's exactly the same thing. So the single arrow is literally an alias for some. Um, so this is a nice way of creating little macros and things. So we no longer need that ugly macro directory we're teaching to. Now you just declare them in what I think is the most natural way possible. And simple things like that just work. Um, subroutines also take, you can give it a whole bunch of formal parameters. Um, so in this one here, we said A and B are both named parameters. They must be provided. If there are any other named parameters, they will get collected up in percent C, which is a hash array. And if there are any other positional arguments, they get collected up in D. So within this, so I can then call this foo function. That's going to be A, that's going to be B, and we've got two name variables, A and X and Y, and a couple more that get shoved in D. Um, and we can basically get this completely wrong, put things in the wrong order, and it will still get worked out, because we've got an A, so that goes to A, and B, so that goes to B, X and Y are names, so they'll go in C, and 50 and 60 end up in D. Uh, yes? What happens if you take the first one and replace X and Y with A and B? Those ones there, uh, in that case they are that, X, A will be that one, B will be that one, all of these will end up in D and you get an error saying that you haven't specified. Oh, no, sorry, if that was A and B. So it's 1020, A, B, yeah, so you just get A and B, be 13, 40, right. 10, 20, 50, and 60 will end up in D. If you just replace X with A but not Y with B, presumably B will be 10. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so what happens is, in here it says I need an A. And it says if I've got a name day, then use that. If I haven't, take the first positional argument. And at the end, if there's anything left over that name parameters, they go in C, and anything else that's position goes in B. If you don't specify a parameter, like if you don't specify an A, you'll get a runtime error saying you didn't specify it. <coughs> Wouldn't it be a good idea to have it as an exception if you, say in this case you've got A, B, and say you name A, but you don't name B, rather than taking the first one, as B, you say, hang on, you've probably given me A twice. That makes me sense. So in the first yes. line, goo, 10, 20, X, Y, 40. Hang on, mate. If you do that sort of thing in functional calls, you take yourself out and you shoot yourself yeah. in the head. You just say everybody else. Yeah. Anyway, this, this, possibly, yes. Um, yeah. This does, um, this is the so best of the way that Python, Ruby, and something else does it a little bit thrown in, so it may still be subject to change, but the point is when you create a subroutine, you can optionally say, I also want these parameters checked, and then it plugs it with the So here's an example, this is quite a nifty one. To create an HTML element, we can say, I must have a type, and I can have a bunch of named attributes followed by a bunch of content, and it just spits mm -hmm. out a string, puts the type in, it calls the new .html actress hash method, which will just take all the contents, encode all the things if they need it, put it in quotes, and make um, an HTML attribute list from it. Content to join slash type. 
So we can call that as HMR and create me an A with an HRF equals home and a little home content here. So it's quite flexible, you can add new parameters and so on. Um, TT3 supports the three signals, dollar as it was in TT2, it just tells TT that there's a variable coming up. So if it was expecting a word or a keyword or a file name or something, if you put a dollar in front, it just said, nah, this is a variable. So if by chance you've got a variable called if, you're, <laughs> you're in trouble, but B, you can actually access it by putting a dollar in front. Um, if is quite unlikely, but things like next and last, they're reserved words in TT2. <coughs> Because they're in capitals, you don't often have flashes. But if you have a, a next keyword, there's a good chance that sooner or later you have a variable called next and you'll have problems. So dollar is your workaround. Um, similarly, after a dot off, we'd normally expect a word here, but if you put a dollar in, it says, now oh, this is the variable, go and look up the, in this case, the user ID and then apply that in there. Um, at can be used to unpack lists. So if you've got a list here, A123, B456, you can put an at on front, just like you would in Perl, to unpack the list. So C ends up being 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Um, at can also be used to force list context. So in TT2, all variables, all functions and methods got called in list context, which was a really bad idea. So now they all get called in scalar context. Um, but if you do need to force it to list context, you can just put an at on front. Um, and similarly, if you've got a dot op, if you've got a bar object and you want to call it as method in this context, you just put the at on there. But I broke that, that's something I broke last week, so don't try that at home. Why? Question? I'm just wondering why you don't have the at on bar. Actually, I'm not sure it's... Because it can change things. Yeah. Yeah, so it might be that you've got two dot bar dot bars and then you want to call the next method in this context, and then a few more after that. So at just says the next thing is a list, or what should be interpreted as, as listy as possible. Um, and in fact, I mean, at technically works with any reference. So if it's a list reference, it will say, oh, I'll unpack you. And if it's a code reference, it'll say, right, I'll call you a code context. Um, hopefully, my, oh, one more slide. Um, I'll jump to that if you've got an object as well, and you've got at in front of it, it will look to see if your object has got a, what's that, TT items method, and if it has it, call it. And similarly, um, interacting with objects, there are lots of things where TT will try and do something, and rather than guess, it will actually see if you've implemented a TT underscore whatever method, which is effectively your contract with TT to do something. Um, so like the app, percent can be used to unpack hashes. So if you've got a hash array, two hash arrays here, you want to join them together, percent will just do the right thing. Some my objects. Um, one of the nice things that comes out of this, because TT3 is an expression language, everything is an expression, so you can have uh, something called generator expressions for free. So if I want to run a bit of code that takes, it starts off with a loop here from 1 to 10, and then we can multiply it by 3, and that will give us the numbers 3, 6, 9, and then we can just capture the whole lot in the list and store that in numbers. And then just to prove it, look. Ta -da. Um, I haven't yet thought of a good use for generator expressions. Perhaps when you're creating table columns or something, it might be you want to iterate through the list. And it's there and it comes for free. And that's kind of nice when things come for free. Um, so that's the basic language. Let's look at some of the other uh, commands now. Fill is the new process. It's three characters shorter, and you don't have to do a shift. Um, and it, I think it. it fits in better than what templates do. So you say fill instead of process. Fill site header. As with TTT, you don't need to quote something coming after fill because it's expecting a file name to be there. Uh, block is the new block. <laughs> it's just in lowercase, so you can fill blocks. Um, blocks are mostly lexically scoped, but there's a few little tricks that go on there. Um, if you need to capture, if you've got a bunch of text and you just want to do something and then assign for a variable, in TT2 you can do something like this, say so message equal block, and you can still do that. We've also got a new um, operator which is is, and is is like equals, but it automatically expects a block after it. So I can just say message is. Da -da -da -da. Yes? So I'll, with the block, I'll just generate the block and then um, not quite. At the moment, and this may change, at the moment a subroutine does what Perl does, and it only returns the last 
value of the, the last expression evaluated. So if you have a sum and you have blah 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 x, then it will return x. With a block, it just takes everything and switches it into text and assumes it's a template. Um, so I, I, I think I'll probably keep that because, again, it's, if you say to a Perl program, a sub is the equivalent of sub, then you know, if they don't like that, they can remain to marry, not me. Um, <laughs> with creates a local scope. So with TT2, you have process, which just process the template, and that's what fills it, just fills it. Uh, whereas include, try to localize the variables and then process the template and then throw away those localized variables. So in TT3, that operation is split into two separate commands, fill for doing the template processing, and with, that creates a local scope. So if I've got two variables, x and y, I can then create a block here saying with, x is 200 and z equals 300, and then within this block, I've got my new values for y, I've got my new value for z, I can still see all the variables defined outside, but if I make any changes in here, they only persist within this block. And when we get down here, everything is restored to how it was before. Is that best? Yes. <coughs> um, so there's an example of using all in one with the semicolons. Three different ways of saying the same thing, just because like Perl, there's more than one way to do it. Um, with TT3, most of the semicolons are optional. Because it's just an expression parse, and it just looks for an expression, and it looks for another expression, and it looks for another expression, a bit of text, a variable, and so on and so on. So you don't often need the semicolons. The semicolons are there, much more like in English, where you use them for pause, or punctuation at the end of the sentence, rather than putting them after every single word. Um, and of course, you can use braces as well, in which case you can do away with semicolons altogether. Um, so saying with some variables fill something is the new way of saying include. So we can write it like that, or we can just do only the braces because it's a single expression. So or if we want to fill several templates, we can do all that within the same with block. Mm -hmm. So if you did that with TT3 as an include, you would be going to all the effort of localizing the variables once, then throw them away, then localize them again, and throw them away, then localize them, and throw them away. This way you can localize them once and do a bunch of stuff and then throw them all away. So with uh, localizing yeah. everything rather than just what you specified? Yes. Right. Um, yes, you can just say with and not specify any variables and it creates a local scope. So in the third moment, if you mutate that, it goes back to what it was. Yes. Side effects work as they do in GT2 and Perl. So you can say if A, fill B, or you can say fill B, if A. Same with four, you can say for x and y, fill z, or fill z for x and y. And the same thing works with with. You can say with these variables, fill this template, or you can say fill this template with these variables. Uh, it's the same thing as TT, which is switch the operators around in a similar way to, say, addition. If you say five plus seven, it's the same as saying seven plus five. It makes no difference. Can't remember if that's commutative or transitive. Yes. Commutative transitive. <laughs> Um, and you can also chain these together, um, because they'll chain indefinitely. So you can come up with some really um, funky expressions. Um, and, and I've been playing with this quite a bit, and with some of these things there's a, a slight paradigm shift, if you'll excuse the slightly pretentious phrase. Um, but a lot of this feels more like writing SQL queries, where it's select this, from this, as this, where this, order by that. So your expressions tend to be uh, you know, each one's a small individual little fragment, and you can just combine them together to make larger sentences. Well, all the sort of very side effect here, it's Yes, it is. It's, there's a very strong functional um, influence there. Um, and as I say, it's possible. I don't know if it's possible to make a pure functional language, but you can certainly disable all the assignment operators. So it's possible to create a language that has no side effect, whether it's useful or not. I can't do I.O., sorry. I was going to say, <laughs> it's generating text. Yeah. <laughs> um, so when you start chaining these things together, it is um, wise to use the limiters wisely. Um, so then the occasional little semicolon here or there or braces not only helps TT get it right. Well, TT always gets it right, so you understand it well. Um, <laughs> it helps TT match your understanding. And also, more importantly, as a, as a human, when you read it, you want people to understand your templates. And, and have them recognize the intent. Uh, just is like with, 
But whereas with creates a local scope and lets you access everything else that's defined, just creates a local scope and detaches it. So within, sorry, just, within a just block, the only variables you can see are the ones that you specify here, x and 10. So um, this is typically used if you've got a template that maybe has, um, you know, if bold, you do this. And if, you know, if the bold variable is set, it'll do something. If the bold isn't variable isn't set, it won't do that. And then you call it and accidentally you've got a bold variable you know, defined half a mile away and it starts behaving like this. So this way you can say, you know, just use these variables x and y and ignore everything. And again, change the lo uh, localised so you can't damage things outside. When you can, you have to try and hide. So you can say just with these variables fill something. And if you haven't got any variables, you can say just fill this template. And then it'll just fill it with no variable. Um, into. Into is the new map up. So you might have a little template like this that just puts some content in the middle of a message div. And you call it like this into wrap a message as oh, well. Any content going there. And into stacks as well, like all the other ones. So you can say fill some template into this wrapper and then into my site layer. And that would just work. That's quite nice. Uh, slot. Slot is the new kind of dynamic block. Um, so this is an example of a, a fairly standard layout template. You've got a bit of header, a bit of content, a bit of footer. And for our master layout, we define some default content for the header, content and footer, and we mark them up as slots. So this is kind of like a block. When TT finds it, it'll just process it. Unless someone else has defined another block that overrides it. So it's kind of like method calls. This is our base class object, and it calls a method, unless someone else subclass has redefined it, in which case it calls a subclass one. So if you find something that slots, they're effectively replaceable blocks. And then in my main template, I can say fill layout main and then define my, define my local block definitions that will get slotted into that layout. And then you can also create subclasses of layouts. So if I want to create a specialized layout for my product section, I can say into my layout main, use this block for the header, and use this slot for the content. Now the difference here is that a block says, this is a block, use it, and it effectively blocks anybody else from redefining it. So when you use this, this particular layout, you can't change the header anymore, because that has been defined by the layout. But the content is still defined as a slot, so that's effectively a, an overridable slot block that someone else can use. So that's kind of like in uh, languages like Java, you can define a method as final, which says that subclasses can't redefine it. And that's what a block is, it blocks shit. Yes, please. Can you have a slot into which you write it, when you write it at multiple times? So, for instance, you've got a chunk here that is this JavaScript, a chunk there that is that JavaScript. And locally, you say, into the JavaScript slot, add this. And then later, you say, into the JavaScript slot, add this to Not yet, but you're going to add it. ELP's <laughs> <laughs> got this idea. Just the afternoon, I ELP's got this idea of you, you declare a block and then you can yield it to. Yes, you can yield it to the thing. You can yield it to it multiple times. Yes, and you can gather that. Yes, I think that. Well, what's that? Um, is all the slots? Oh, is the block kind of that slot labeling evaluated so you can die it's not there? Um, and you forgot to assign some content. I suppose it's just in the original definition of the slot. Yeah, you just put the die. Yeah, you just put the die in the original slot. Uh, effectively like in a base class method, so you die, don't call this base class method, base class method. So yes, it's really done. Slot time, I only plug these in I think on Wednesday, so it's still um, it's still a bit. Because <laughs> I mean, to be fair, a lot of this, uh, this is actually the fourth implementation of TT3, there have been many sort of prototype lines, one to test the parser, one to test this. So a lot of it's been about picking out those best things, some ideas I've tried and they didn't maybe work so well, and that's better. So things are still subject to change. Um, so that's using our custom product layout. So we fill that product and provide some new content and it just works. But I'm going to speed up now because I'm running late. Um, so if you want to load new commands, you can use the commands control. Um, all these runtime ones, or sorry, all these compile time ones are still in the case because I think shouting is good there. Um, so this one just says load, wrapper, and include, and their aliases for, for their effect using the same with the LTT2 version.
You can also have them in lower case if you want. In fact, any case you spe specify and just find the right thing. And you can give them aliases as well. So I can say, well, I want the wrapper to actually be the into command, I want the include to be the fill command. And if you get confused about which way around that is, you can use as instead, which is as is like another operator like is, which is just equals but backwards. So A equals B is the same as B as A. Confused? <laughs> anyway, so you can load different commands, you can give them aliases. Uh, HTML command, this is really nice. So this allows you to lo load some extra commands that just generate bits of HTML. So for example here I'm loading the B command, which creates a bubble tag. And it's a block directive, so I can do it like this, or I can use semicolons like this, or I can do it in braces like this, or I can just use it like this. So the output of this is to turn my look inside. Just coming back in all four cases, I get my this is bold back in my bold tag. Um, we give those aliases as well, and because they're just expressions, they stack. So I can say I want something that's bold and italic, and that will just nest those two tabs and okay. break them like that. Yeah. Um, yes? Can you say yes to the question? Oh, never mind, you're about to give one anyway. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so here's another example creating a, a list. Um, using UL and LI, so I can just say I want to generate a UL, this is the content I want in it, and I've got three LIs here. And the nice thing is that these are, these are uh, native TT3 operators, so you can combine that with any other TT3 commands. For example, here we can create a UL list using a for loop to generate our items here. Do they cover <laughs> um, here's a, a slightly more hacky version of the above. So again, just using, we've got rid of the braces, we say UL, do a four, and this is just a bit of showing off here. We can take a single string and pull the uh, virtual methods on it, and the rest of the same. If you've got attributes, can you see that okay? Um, so this is using div UL li and a, define a simple menu here as a list of hash refs. That would probably be off in a YAML file or something else. Um, and then in the square brackets here, we can put in attributes to go with the command. And you can actually use any brackets there, but I think the, the square brackets best fit in with the uh, X part specification, so it's kind of closest to HTML tags. So here we create a div with a, an ID of header, a UL with a class and menu, we do a for loop, and then we generate an ally with an A inside it with our href set to the link and the text for this. So, kind of long story short. Generates a nice little menu for you. Which looks like shit because it takes too long. But uh, you didn't have to look at that shit, you didn't have to write that shit. Um, there's a couple of optimizations because you know, if you're doing lots of CSS based stuff these days, you write lots of IDs and lots of classes. So, in fact, we can use the CSS <laughs> too much. So, I'm pretty certain that is minimal. There's nothing you could take away without uh, changing the meaning of it. If you get hammered, they get away from the... Uh, <laughs> get rid of the div. Get rid of the div, yeah. There's like you always need div, so... Hammer? All right. So, so, so basically, a uh, hash key almost always is going to be div ID. Yeah, we, we can't use hash, though, because yeah. that's common. So it's <laughs> here, there's a special exception. I know, but if it's hash, we'll have a space. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> OK, so, yeah, um, it's not minimal. But it's minimal <laughs> without being... Do the right thing is. <laughs> so it's minimal but firm. Um, so, in summary, um, I've just shown you a few of the things you can do, there's a fair bit more. Um, but TT3 is more like Perl in the sense that there's fewer surprises, it's got a proper parser, it's got a proper language, it really works, and there aren't weird edge cases due to a hacky parser. Um, it's also more like JavaScript, so JavaScript is a very popular language. Nice, kind of fun, but people do a lot of it, particularly people doing templates that tend to be native on JavaScript as well. So wherever we can do the same thing that JavaScript does, as long as it doesn't conflict with Perl, that's a good thing. Rename with the letter. Um, let, that's in JavaScript 1.5, isn't it? With one, uh, one let, let is not actually a fixed expect, but right. it's basically how your width behaves. Yeah, I think let is, I always found let a bit ambiguous, because it behaves slightly differently in different languages. Um, yeah, whereas so it is, yeah. Anyway, you can rename it if you like. <laughs> I look forward to your dialect. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, it's also a bit more like Python. So, you know, there's less signals, you don't have dollars on variables, and some of the um, commands are spelt out, like um, the range of like dot dot, you can say two instead. You can say for A in one, two, ten, five, three, and that's just a bit more English ish. Um, there's also a bit of oh, there's also a bit of Ruby influence there, particularly with the lightweight blocks and stuff, and small talk, of course, behind Ruby. Um, and Lisp in terms of the functional nature, and everything is an expression, so everything is, can be combined. And that's I think the, the nicest thing about Lisp. You know, if you get nothing else out of Lisp, it's that there are very few simple commands, if you like, that you can then combine to create richer expressions. So that's kind of where I want to go. Uh, it's also a bit more like SQL, SQL, in that you know it's kind of you can write these long statements that are last select, there, um, and it's a bit more like Basic as well, because you know Basic is a nice simple language. You just type stuff and it works. And surprisingly, it's also the language it's most similar to is Algol 68. And strange enough, about a month ago, someone wrote a blog about this, saying that Algol 68 was the coolest language ever written. And why aren't we writing language like that? So, um, Alba City, that was, that was released a year before I was born. That makes me feel old. But... Uh, and also, it can be whatever you want it to be. So, you can even customize it, change things, and whatever. Uh, you can write a full application of typing in your template. Yes. <laughs> so, TT3 is. I don't know if TT3 is better than a pony, but it's certainly better than TT2. It's better, it's stronger, and it's. will be faster. <laughs> There's a couple of things at the moment, it all um, builds an expression tree and then evaluates the tree directly. So there's no um, <coughs> parsing it down to Perl and then running the Perl. So that's one thing we can do to speed that up. Um, also, there's no XS components. In TT2, there's the XS function <coughs> version to speed up. So if you run it today, you know, it's sluggish. It's you know, maybe between two and four times slower than using the equivalent TT2. But at the moment, I would don't care about that, it's about getting the features working and making sure it's actually worth optimizing and people want to use it and so on. So we can make it faster. Uh, it's much more flexible, you can change it. Uh, it's inspectable, you can actually get inside the template and see what's going on, either for debugging, for syntax analysis. Um, also things like um, you know, having a, a TT3 critic module. You might really want to you know, run the company templates through a process which says, ah, oh, you're using a variable there, you should use that way around. Transformability, you can take this template, you can generate HTML, you can generate Perl, you can generate Python, JavaScript. Um, and all of this flexibility really leads to the backwards compatibility. Because you have to be able to let TT3 run TT2. Otherwise, you guys will lynch me. Because um, <laughs> everything will be broken. So um, that's, you know, this bit is important. TT3 runs two languages at least, TT3 and TT2. Um, and best of all, it should be here in time for Christmas. Woo! <laughs> I'm not saying it's Christmas, <laughs> but it will be released on Tuesday sometime shortly after lunch. And now let's say about 2.15. Um, and best of all, it doesn't smell of piss. <laughs> um, tell me it's good try hard, it could be faster, it could be a bit more comfortable, there's a few rough edges. The documentation is sparse, and of course it just took some bloody long. Um, here's the roadmap. Are you all waiting to go or should I just carry on for a while? Okay, um, so the roadmap is um, TT3 Alpha will be coming out very soon, and this is just really testing the TT3 stuff. Um, template TT2 is the new version of version 2, and that's been moved into the template TT2 namespace. That's in Alpha at the moment, but that'll be going out in Beta to make sure everyone's happy that that works the same as the old TT2 does. And then we can do a proper template TT3 Beta release, which will have both dialects running together, and at that point you should plug it into existing TT2 systems and see what breaks. Assuming it doesn't break, we can then release template G3. At which point, I shall have a swift ale um, before writing some XS components to make it faster, writing the Perl compiler backend for maximum speed. Um, other backends as well, I'd like to target JavaScript so we can do what Gemplate does, and Parrot as well. Parrot's obviously very exciting. Um, then I shall have a large brand need, and then I'll have to work on a, a complete C runtime library. I've got about 90% of it working in rough beta form. But I, uh, it may only be an experiment, but I'd like to be able to compile all my templates in a C library and run them in C, and then just call back out to Perl when you need to do some Perl stuff, or call back out to Python or Ruby or whatever 
It's going to be self-hosted. Yes, well, ultimately, I mean, the, the target I'm aiming for is PHP. You know, I'd like to be in a position where you can have a better language than PHP, where you can just drop a template into a file and it works. And then if, you, if you're just doing simple stuff, it just run natively. But if you want to do database stuff, you can then load your favorite Perl module. I meant by you going to implement it in itself. Oh, sorry, I, I misunderstood that. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> Not this week, anyway. Um, so hopefully, um, it'll be good enough for 10 years. And I'll see you back here in 2019. <laughs>